Hi, this is Mike McCabe of OccupyRadio.net. Those of you that know me know that housing has been a big issue of mine for a long time. But more recently, I've been focusing on climate change. Last week, the IPCC report was delivered to the UN, and the content was startling. The report explains how little time we have to decrease our carbon footprint before global temperatures rise above the two point Celsius mark that people have been trying to prevent. That will forever change our world as we know it. Earlier today, I had a discussion with Dr. Jose Javier Hernandez Alea, the Assistant Professor and Director of the Climate Research Center at Sonoma State University. I would like you to watch this video and please pay special attention to what the professor says. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, I would like to thank you, Professor, for uh, uh, allowing us this time for the interview. No, and I want to thank you for, you know, like uh, uh, coordinating with me and working, even though we're on different sides of the country, you know. And, and yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, Jorge had, uh, had some t something to do with that uh, as well. Yeah. So, uh, uh, actually, the first thing I'd like to talk about, the, the uh, first thing I read this morning was an article in the Washington Post that uh, talks about the uh, IPCC report. And then you also had, had sent an open letter mm -hmm. to the uh, city officials in Sonoma, California. Mm -hmm. um, and you explained that we're, uh, the temperature rise is actually uh, coming faster than we had anticipated. Yes. Could you, could you explain a, a little bit, a little bit yes, about yes, your letter? Yes, right. So, you know, so in, in the IPCC, right, all of the different scientists that have gotten together to work on, you know, addressing the climate change uh, issue, uh, we've been trying to prevent uh, to get global mean uh, temperatures uh, or try to prevent them from increasing by, by 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? And, and right now, uh, like, you know, like if we're, you're reading today in the Washington Post and, and in many other cases, we already arrived to that, you know, like uh, allowable threshold in many places in the planet. And right now we're trying to really avoid to get to the two degrees Celsius uh, increase of global mean temperature. It's, it's important to, you know, understand that, you know, temperature varies uh, a lot, you know, from place to place. And when it comes to, you know, like the uh, temperature that we see out there, those kind of a thresholds, those limits that we're trying to uh, stay within are, we're talking about global uh, temperature, right? So uh, so what we're seeing today is that, you know, like uh, contrary to what, you know, previous IPCC reports were saying is that we're getting to those limits, to those um, increases in temperature uh, way faster than expected, right? And this is something that you know, our models are not, you know, predicting, predicting that well, because, you know, we, we can't really uh, predict the rate at which, the rate of change at which, you know, the Earth system is going to react to all of, not only, you know, more greenhouse gases means more energy, more long wave radiation is being trapped by the Earth. You know, all of this uh, energy is, is also causing other changes, kind of a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Right, that is is altering uh, the Earth system, which is which which then reinforces the warming and accelerates uh, the warming uh, in many ways. Right, and and what we're seeing is that right now those thresholds are being you know like um, or those temperature limits are being surpassed uh, in many places, but and still at the global level uh, we haven't uh, gotten to those um, you know like temperatures. And we're trying to, you know, like, um, and I think the latest report um, saying that by 2030, 2040, we need, you know, real, real, you know, climate action in order to prevent uh, the worst. Because even if we stopped, uh, you know, right now, all of our greenhouse uh, emissions, uh, we're still going to be uh, experiencing a lot of, um, you know, like uh, climate change um, enhanced uh, phenomena for you know, the next, you know, 50, 100 years you know, into the future, even even more years, because we know how much uh, time it takes that carbon to be um, sequestered and, and being, you know, draw down back to the biosphere. Right. Now, uh, 
I've often heard about uh, the ice sheets melting in Greenland, and that yep. would ra raise the uh, the uh, sea levels by something like seven meters, which would basically put Miami Beach I underwater know. by like 19 feet. Yep. And I understand it's happening, as you just said, much quicker yep. than we had anticipated. Yep. Uh, w this this is really a, a difficult situation for communities to be able to prepare uh, at, at this point uh, because it's accelerating so quickly. So uh, I know our own community here has been working on a resilient plan because I live in a community in Red Hook, Brooklyn, where we had a, uh, the Sandy hurricane hit us and we had uh, six feet of water here. Mm -hmm. And th this building, no one could live here for uh, at least seven months. So, uh, you know, so it's taking our community over a year to put this plan together. And the community really hasn't gotten very much help from the city. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, you know, one of my concerns is getting getting prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you go into more detail? That I know the, the numbers that came out last week regarding land use. Oh, yeah. Uh, like the new report from the IPCC focusing yeah. on, on the land uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. So Ooh. this, you know, so this this report is kind of a preamble to uh, the new upcoming report from the IPCC that we'll be getting at some point uh, this year. And th this one focuses mostly on the interaction between, you know, the land and the other uh, systems of the earth. So, for example, we have the atmosphere, we have the oceans. Right, and then uh, we have the biosphere, and or and or the hydrosphere. We we want to talk about the oceans and you know the ice sheets uh, together. But this one focuses mostly uh, on the land, and really uh, the take home message is is not only about you know the uh, greenhouse gases that we're emitting because of fossil fuels, is because of the way that we utilize the land, right? For you know for um, agriculture, industrial uh, agriculture, urbanization. Right. And the way that we utilize uh, is not only that we're using, you know, the land and we have degraded the land. So now the quality of those soils have been degraded and are, you know, you know, are not in their optimum levels is also, you know, the, the way that we, you know, like grow the food, you know, and, and extract energy, the water. Right? So all of this is related because the we have to think about climate change as a. Um, let's say a process in which we have different systems interacting with each other, right? And and what happens, you know, over a given year, for example, in Brazil right now, what we're seeing with the new election of of President Jair Bolsonaro, we are seeing an increase in the deforestation of the of Brazilian Amazon, right? And that's gonna not only this stabilize, you know, the uh, energy, you know, and the interactions between the atmosphere ocean you know biosphere uh in that area is also going to have global uh, impacts is adding more um you know carbon dioxide into the atmosphere more greenhouse gases is messing up with the water cycle uh in that area we know how important it is the amazon rainforest or you know like you know just water resources overall um and the carbon cycle at, at the planetary level right and this is a great example in how you know, like politics, economics, right, and 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 you know, like policy uh, influence. You know, all of this. You know what I said, and this is what I said. You know, in the open letter. You know, the debate is not about uh, whether this is happening or not. Whether is is us or just normal natural variability. That's there's no debate in the scientific community. We know that uh, it's mostly us, at least since the 1950s. And, and we know what we need to do. The, the only obstacle that we, you know, have in our way to be able to manage land, you know, the land resource the best way possible are the economic interest of, you know, a minority that controls our governments and controls our corporations in the planet. And, you know, with this recent IPC report, it just reinforces what, you know, scientists have been saying uh, all along that in order for us to really produce drastic changes, you know, reduce uh, emissions, we do not only need to rely less on fossil fuels, we also need 
to rethink the way that we manage uh, the land, the way that we grow our food, the way that we extract energy from uh, the land, the way that we utilize the water, right? That is over land. We have to really move away from this, um, you know, like simple narrative that, you know, we live in a planet with resources to exploit, right? And, and you know, like as humans, as the species that's dominating right now our planet, um, we uh, have like a free reign to do whatever we want and nothing's going to happen. That's not necessarily the case. You know, it's, it's telling us what the, the hot house paper uh, also was arguing researchers last year talking about how it's not really, you know, like we, we know a lot about the physical processes driving climate change. And we also know uh, about the socioeconomic processes driving climate change, but we don't want to act on those. Right? And I think this recent IPCC report is is just you know telling us you know that we need to really think about you know our diets, uh, think about the way that we just think of land and land resource and and best practices. You know, right. like ecology. Um, you know, like trying to reduce erosion as much as we can in order to, you know, like at least uh, improve some, you know, like, uh, like crop yields. Because right now one of the issues is that we are, you know, industrial agriculture is by, by eliminating so much of, of, you know, vegetation cover in these areas, is exposing that soil to, you know, the atmospheres, to the wind, to the water. You're, 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 we have a big, big issue uh, with erosion at the global scale, with some places having, you know, like a worse situation than others. But this is something that could be uh, addressed. And I think they state that locally we have done a lot of great things to minimize this, but at the global level, there's still a lot that we can do. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the, to change your diets, and that's one of the things that came out of these recent numbers uh, so quickly, uh, like the, the beef industry is a $76 billion industry. And yes. what, what they're basically asking us is to reduce that. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be some time uh, involved to change that. Uh, so you know, it's going to be very difficult for society to, to, to do that overnight. Yeah. And I think right now, like, you know, the issue is that I think in the developed world, like the way that I don't like to talk about developer developing world, you know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, I like to think about like, um, you know, uh, exploited and, and, you know, the people who are doing the exploiting and the people who are being exploited. That's the way that I like to uh, think about. But usually what we have this, you know, what so-called developing countries is that they are, they're want, they want to mimic, right, the same lifestyle that we have mm -hmm. here uh, in the West. And, you know, in the West, a lot of people like I, me and my family were vegetarians. We're trying to transition into veganism now for, you know, six years. And we did it for health reasons and also for, you know, like uh, reducing our carbon footprint. But, you know, telling that to people who, you know, are just now, you know, like seeing some kind of improvement uh, in their life and they see this, you know, dietary change as something that is, is good for them. You know, well, while people in the West have been doing this for, you know, like years and years is, is kind of a, you know, and this is the same, the same thing that, you know, happens when it comes to, you know, like uh, greenhouse gases overall and emissions. I was reading this report um, with my students from Oxfam talking about the uh, inequality in emissions and how, you know, like uh, the 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 fifty percent, the poor, the poor fifty percent, the three point five billion people, you know, that are, you know, like on the kind of a um, you know, poor to poorest in the planet only produce 10% uh, of the emissions, while the 1% produces, you know, almost 50% uh, of the emissions, right? So we have to think about, you know, like, uh, we can do a lot individually, right? We can do a lot in terms of our actions. We can walk more, you know, bike, change our diets, change our light bulbs, but there are some, you know, structural, massive infrastructure, global things that need to happen in order for us to yeah. And we can't really, you know, like, you know, like blame everyone, give everyone the same blame uh, on this, uh, because even here in the U.S., you know, if we if you were to break down, you know, who are the people who are, you know, the, the biggest polluters is going to be the top one ten percent of 
population, right? In terms yeah. of, of of income, uh, too, right? So we have to really be uh, aware of those things because then those are the people who spend two hundred million dollars a year on you know, lobbying, you know, in order to prevent any type of climate legislation. These are the five, five big oil corporations that are you know like pouring money into the political, you know, into our political uh, system uh, in order you know, to prevent us from doing any kind of real, you know, like uh, climate change, you know, like action. Well, that's, that's one of the things that I was kind of concerned with and, and upset with is that the, the report came out and it, as you said in, in your letter, it's, it's understated. It's oh, yeah. not really talking about where we really are. And I, and I suspect it's probably because uh, the authors have had to go through the, lo- the, the legal system with their legal advisors and yeah. they're telling them to hold back. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, you know, to me, that's a ridiculous. It's like saying that, you know, the fire that's outside my house is only going to singe my lawn instead of burn my house down. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a crazy situation. Now, yeah. you you've written a couple of papers uh, regarding uh, the uh, precip- precipitation in Puerto Rico and what happened there. Uh, can you explain more of what happened uh, with yeah. uh, with that hurricane? Yeah. So so uh, as as I'm a um, you know climatologist. Uh, and my research focuses on extreme weather events and their relations to climate variability and change. So I've been doing a lot of my research. I'm from Puerto Rico, born and raised, and I was, um, you know, born in September, which is the peak month of hurricanes. Hurricane Hugo, Hortons, and Georges destroyed my birthdays uh, back home. So I have, you know, like a lot of history with uh, hurricanes. And, you know, out of the um, six, uh, academic papers that I publish in, you know, like mainstream scientific journals. Uh, five of them are related to hurricanes, and uh, the first papers focus mostly on understanding why is it that some storms produce more rainfall than others, and I identify some characteristics of those storms uh, in the tropics or in tropical islands like Puerto Rico. It really doesn't matter if hurricane is category four, five, or tropical depression; they can still produce. Very extreme precipitation in Puerto Rico, for example, we have uh, one of those cases in 1985 of of a storm, a tropical storm uh, that went down to tropical depression, producing a lot of heavy rainfall that led to one of the deadliest mudslides in North American history. Right, so that was one of my the the key findings of my studies was that in the case of tropical islands like Puerto Rico, maybe even Hawaii, maybe Taiwan, it doesn't really matter intensity. Uh, it matters mostly where the Iowa of the storm is located relative to the island. If it's closer, moving slower, there's a lot of moisture in the environment, and this, this storm is, can produce a lot of heavy rainfall. So in my latest paper uh, with my uh, colleague, Dr. David Keelings from the University of Alabama, so we were trying to determine how much of a Hurricane Maria's extreme rainfall could be uh, associated with um, climate change. Right, so in our analysis, we uh, analyze all extreme precipitation that has happened in Puerto Rico in 35 historical stations since 1956 to 2018. <clears throat> and uh, also analyze uh, and compare Maria's extreme rainfall with that of a previous 128 other tropical cyclones that have impacted Puerto Rico. And we tested uh, you know, those time series of, of extreme precipitation events, let's say above the 99th percentile, like the top 1% uh, of events every year. And we tested, you know, we compared, we did kind of a linear model. And uh, we, what we found was that, you know, one of our hypotheses was, well, maybe Hurricane Maria um, was just part of this normal climate variability that we see, you know, in the Caribbean with, you know, when years that we have, you know, kind of a, a weak El Nino or even La Nina conditions, we have, you know, higher frequency of storms. You know, we are maybe in the, we're in the face in the, in the Atlantic Oceans, in the Atlantic Ocean where we have uh, warmer uh, SST. So we have a lot of, you know, like El Nino is the best example of what climate variability is, which are, you know, like processes that are expected predictable every two to seven years in the case of El Nino, in the case of other 
oscillations, maybe decadal uh, oscillations. We wanted to test whether the extreme rainfall of Maria was mostly, you know, normal variability of the climate system, or if it was climate change. What we found was that in more than half of the stations that we analyzed in Puerto Rico, Maria was found to be mostly connected uh, with climate change. So um, climate change made Hurricane Maria's rainfall 4.85 times more likely mm -hmm. uh, in Puerto Rico based on our findings. And what this is saying is that since you know the Atlantic Ocean, as many other oceans in the planet are storing a lot of energy, a lot of carbon, removing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, they're warming up. Right? Not only the acidity is changing, impacting coral reefs, impacting, impacting you know, like uh, the, the, just the, the, the food, what the, the whole web uh, of change in the ocean. So the Atlantic Ocean is getting warmer. Uh, that means that we're going to have more energy for tropical cyclones to develop uh, more, more intense uh, tropical cyclones mm -hmm. that can develop into stronger hurricanes. That mean more moisture in the environment also means that there's going to be more rainfall that could fall. In the yeah. form but of but the ocean is is already at what ninety five percent capacity. Oh, yeah. So, so that, I think I think we're we're not you know we're not in the climate apocalypse right now thanks to the ocean. You know if we if, if planet Earth was you know more land you know than water you know the land to water ratios it was more land we would be in a very very different situation right, right. the oceans are really you know kind of a a cushion that is keeping you know the more extreme uh from taking place but at, at the same time you know we have to think about hurricanes as cooling mechanisms of the planet so if the planet is warming up at a very fast rate it's also going to try to cool off it's going to react right and it's, it's going to try to develop more and more tropical cyclones more hurricanes to go in and cool all of those uh, places that are warming up uh, so quick. And one of the concerns right now is that now those, like you mentioned earlier with Sandy, and last year we had Ophelia, we had a couple of years ago, we had some, some tropical cyclones making it all the way to the UK, to mm -hmm. Ireland, right, to really far up north uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So right now it's not only about, you know, hurricanes bringing more rainfall to places that uh, usually get, you know, hit by hurricanes, these hurricanes are moving farther north following yeah. those warmer surface temperatures. Yeah. And uh, the, the, other, the other problem that we have to consider, and, and you, you move from Puerto Rico to California, so you, you go from the rains to the fires. And you know, yeah. I, I had mentioned to you that I had filmed some of uh, the land in paradise. Oh yeah. Where we drove for three, three and a half miles down the same street. And every building had been burned to the ground. The only thing standing were the chimneys and yeah. the fireplaces. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a nightmare. I still remember. So I remember uh, Paradise last year, like here in, in Sonoma County, we had, you know, just weeks with, you know, one of the worst air quality in the entire planet. You know, I lived here, you know, so, I, I, so I've been, you know, I've been in Ohio, Florida, Texas, and now I'm here working as, you know, full-time faculty at Sonoma State University. And, you know, the, state, the first semester that I moved in, you know, Hurricane Maria, you know, destroyed, you know, like uh, my country, my family was, you know, I, I didn't speak with them, you know, almost, you know, two weeks after the storm came because the storm really destroyed the whole, you know, like uh, electrical grid in the island because it's, it's, that's the other thing, you know, like if we know in Puerto Rico what needs to happen in order to become more resilient, in order to you know, be more prepared and, and, and not necessarily suffer as much. But the political and economic actors in the island, you know, they really don't care about this. Right? The, because, the, the unfortunate part about Puerto Rico, though, is that when they began to rebuild the electrical system, they just duplicated what they already had instead of putting yeah. everything underground. Yes. No, and we have we have experts in the island. We have uh, the Institute for Renewable Energy, um, in in the in, in the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West. I have some colleagues there, and they already had a like a plan on how to make Puerto Rico 100% renewable, more resilient. Put some of those um, you know wires under the under the ground because right now what happens in Puerto Rico is that energy most of the energy is produced in the south, 
And then big transmission lines connect to the, the higher demand, higher population areas in the north, right? So, and then you have really rock terrain, really complex terrain in the central mountains in Puerto Rico. So, you know, if, if a hurricane comes and destroys those big transmission lines, and you need to go with helicopters, you need to go with equipment uh, to, you know, bring that system up again. So instead of, you know, like focusing mostly on kind of a micro grids in the island where energy is produced near the source, a combination of renewables, like we see in Costa Rica, for example, uh, in our neighbor, a neighboring country with 5 million people who is running 100% renewable, almost 100% renewable since 2017. Instead of doing that, they just rebuild the entire, the entire, you know, like you mentioned, and, they, and they're still <laughs> rebuilding it. And, and the first thing that they did after the, the hurricane, instead of getting the help from the American Public Power uh, Association, you know, like all the different public utilities in the country, mm-hmm. they decided to hire this small firm from Montana called Whitefish. And they had, what, 12 yeah. people on staff? I mean, yeah. that, that was ridiculous, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in order to, they were like the main contractor in order to subcontract the rest, and this is this is how uh, our colonial government operates in the island. So you know, Puerto Rico is a colony, so it's there to serve the interest of you know major international U.S. mostly U.S. corporations and the you know the elite political class in the island that serves those interests, right? So they're not going to do anything uh, against those uh, interests. And so right now in Puerto Rico, we have a coal plant in the southeastern area of the island uh, that, you know, my friends and colleagues, my environmental activists in Puerto Rico are trying to bring down because they are storing the ash from this coal plant in another town in southern Puerto Rico. And, you know, those towns are the ones that have the most, you know, the highest incidence of, you know, breath, respiratory issues, skin cancer, this ash is contaminating the soil, it's contaminating the aquifers. And, and southern Puerto Rico is, is the big like agricultural area of the island, right? The coastal plains in the south. And they they continue to do this because the government, you know, they donate the same thing that happens in the US, right? So you have corporations donating, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to political campaigns. And then, you know, government the, the people who are elected then they either do nothing to, you know, like uh, prevent those companies from doing that, or they even give contracts or expand the privilege, the privileges of those uh, corporations. But yeah, like, uh, so here, like going back to the question of the wildfires. So it's it's crazy because I was, you know, we were dealing, me and my wife were both from Puerto Rico and we're dealing with, um, you know, the situation with our family. And then two weeks later, when my mom calls me, she's calling me crying because she heard about the wildfires here. You know, we had to, yeah. you know, evacuate and, you know, we were out of our house for almost two weeks, you know, all over Northern California. We had to go to Sacramento to stay with family. Then we went to Oakland mm-hmm. and we couldn't go back. And, you know, it was it was terrifying, terrifying experience. Yeah. And one to the, think that, yeah. Well, one of the things that I had learned when I w- went out there was that there was a location that the community of paradise was supposed to go to. Uh, but unfortunately, the fire was so great that that location itself needed to be evacuated. So I, I, I guess what I'm getting to is that communities are going to have to look at worst case scenarios and, and go further away from their communities to be safe. Yeah. Uh, um, we, we expect to have more fires uh in the future yeah do you think that the range the area will also increase do we yeah have, uh, yeah what we're seeing what we're seeing in california is not only a higher frequency in terms of the number of wildfires we're seeing also an increase in the area right impact of wildfires and not only here that's this is the global scale i think nasa released recently like a fire atlas showing you know like wildfires since 2001 to 2016. And I think this year, recently, we've seen, you know, wildfires in the Northern Territories in Canada. Well, I was in Vancouver and, and yeah. uh, there were fires there, yeah. yeah and, and all the way up in Alaska, right? So we're seeing that it's not only, you know, the frequency of these events, the range in terms of their area and their range also in terms of latitude, 
uh, is changing, right? Is is now we have, you know, a higher frequency of those wildfires, big wildfires happening farther north in places that are frozen, you know, like for you know a big portion uh, of the year, or you know that are you know extremely cold at some point of the year. So what we're seeing is that, and I think in the IPCC report and the previous one, they stated really well. Um, even though they underestimate a lot of this, and I think it's for you know like uh, various reasons. You know, the, the first one is that they don't want uh, to create the hysteria, like they say, like oh, like oh, we can't be responsible and say that this is all going to happen. But this is already happening. Right? Right, we, right. Just so look we, out the window. <laughs> yeah, we 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 are living. I think you know a lot of maybe a lot of the scientists are not necessarily you know experiencing you know the the, the because of where they're located that the worst of this, but. You know, I can tell you that you know my two homes are have been you know devastated by events that had been made worse by climate. Because it's not like oh it's uh, hurricanes, it's climate change, and well no no wildfires and hurricanes will happen in California and in Puerto Rico. What we're seeing is that their frequency and their duration, their extent is 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 becoming you know greater because of, you know we're living in a warmer planet. We're living in a drier. So in the case of California, that 2017, uh, some records of extreme. This is interesting because uh, this is this is how, how everything is connected. Because here in California, in 2017, we, you know, there were some records of precipitation broken earlier in the year because we get our rainy season from November to April, and that allowed a lot of vegetation to grow, right, in Northern California, and then we get our normal dry period from kind of a end of May to end of October. And that year we also experienced, you know, very extreme temperatures and records were broken. I remember driving my wife to work and seeing that the thermometer in my car was 115 degrees, even warmer than what I experienced in Texas and Florida or even in Puerto Rico. And then like a couple of weeks later, we get the wildfires here, right? So this is the combination of how everything is connected. We can't remove one process this other process. We can't isolate, you know, this, you know, like event from this other is is all connected, right? And this is why I think in order for us to address something as complex as climate change and minimize the impacts, we can still, you know, like live in a more climate, weather and climate extreme world. Uh, we just need, you know, to use the resources that we have, the technology that we have, uh, to mobilize millions of people uh, in order for us to, you know, be able to survive in this new um, age, right? Because even even if we stop, like I said in the open letter, you know, even if we if we stopped uh, today, you know, we're still gonna be, you know, uh, witnessing, you know, like the um, kind of about the the climate change enhanced events that we are witnessing all over uh, the planet for, you know, who knows, 50, 100, 150 years, 200 years into the future. We really don't uh, know if, if the planet will be able to, you know, the same way that sometimes right now today we see the planet accelerating a lot of this, um, you know, like processes that had certain you know, like um, interconnections with others, maybe in the future, the planet will be able to recover um, in, a, in a different way, in a quicker way. What we don't know, what we know is that, you know, even if we stop today, um, this is going to continue, right? Mm-hmm. For, uh, you know, for our children, our grandchildren, our great, great grandchildren to deal um, with this. And my argument is, is, is a simple one, you know, like uh, we have to change the way that we see this, this mm-hmm. earth. Right, and this goes against uh, the major economic uh, way of thinking. Right, the the the, the global neoliberal uh, capitalist system that views the earth as this, you know, a collection of resources in, on which we extract and extract and never give back, never restore. Well, Indigenous people of the world have been telling us that for quite some time. Yeah. All right. Uh, in, have you gotten any response from the officials uh, from your open letter? Yeah, I've gotten some responses from some local officials here in Sonoma County. 
I think here in Sonoma County, we have uh, a city already passed some climate action uh, legislation, you know, for declaring climate emergency, the city of Petaluma has. So we're trying to get uh, the other cities here in Sonoma County, Santa Rosa, which is the bigger uh, city where I live, you know, like uh, Sebastopol, Windsor. So we have a lot of other uh, cities in smaller towns where we're trying to get on board. And the idea is to, you know, like uh, force this, you know, you know, force the state, you know, spread this all over the state and, you know, like make this priority because this this is something that, you know, all politicians, mostly from, you know, we know that, you know, the Republican Party, you know, a lot of those politicians, don't, they don't even um, uh, accept science. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's because they are not aware. I think it's because their interests are at stake if they do accept. But these people have families. They have children in most cases. They should be thinking about their own children yeah. and their families. I, know, I think it, it goes again to this idea of short term, you know, profit that right. drives everything. Right. We need we need to, you know, get as much as we can in the less time possible with the least effort possible. And again, this goes against, you know, the way that we should be uh, treating uh, our planet. But yes, I got some responses. I'm, I'm going to be meeting with some of the officials later uh, this month. I'm going to be going to some, some town halls, um, you know, to discuss, you know, like uh, the climate emergency, um, like uh, bills that are going to be introduced uh, here in Sonoma County. And I think, you know, our idea is to like almost everything in California develops from, you know, like the local, the local level mm -hmm. to the state level is, 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 is kind of a, you know, the, the local level forces the state to take action on many ways. And that's what, that's what our, that's what our strategy mm -hmm. uh, is right now. We're also, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think it's enough. You know, I think we need faster, but here in California, there are, I think it's one of the fewer states who is trying to ban, you know, like uh, internal combustion engine cars uh, by 2040. I think they should do it by 2030 or even earlier. They should get incentives to people to, to uh, use more public transit, transition more into electrical vehicles. I right? create the, the circumstances for people, for people like like me, you know, like a working class uh, people to be able to. Um, you know, like, uh, because I'll, I'll, right now, the, you know, I think the biggest obstacle is that the system is designed uh, for us to just be dependent on fossil fuels. I, I think a lot of people would like to switch to renewables. Right now here we have Sonoma Clean Power, uh, which was an effort by local activists, local organizations, Center for Climate Protection here in Santa Rosa, uh, which allows us, you know, like, uh, you know, like, users right of, of, of energy uh, to get you know uh, 60 70 80 percent 100 percent energy from renewable uh, resources but but it was because the community organized and fought for it right now we're also trying to uh, pass uh, a bill on public banking here in, in mm -hmm. Santa I, Rosa. I read that yeah is a lot of things is, is that how, how do we fund this when Wall Street banks uh, you know, only fund whatever venture is going to make them the most money in the least amount of time, right? And, you know, one of the things that uh, we want to do here is uh, have the institutions in place that could help, you know, like uh, first, you know, give people, you know, good paying jobs so that they can restore uh, the ecosystems, they can rebuild the new infrastructure that is needed, they can you know, revamp our buildings, you know, in order to make uh, this place a lot safer, a lot more resilient to what's going to happen. And also, you know, like have institutions in place that could, you know, finance uh, all of this at the local regional level. Right. So there's there's many things, you know, that we can we're trying to do at the local level. We had a town hall uh, back in I think it was May or April of this year on how to, you know, the Green New Deal, which, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. the new, like, wing of the Democratic Party, the more progressive candidates like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders, right, are, are trying to uh, introduce this, this, this major industrial uh, policy, right, uh, which I still think is, is, is not 
uh, enough, I think should be even more ambitious, right? Yeah. I think it should well, be. I'm, well, I'm part of the Green Party. And the Green, Party, the Green Party actually wrote the Green New Deal. I know, I know, I, I, I know that they've been. It out, so. Yeah, so it's, it's a cool idea now because the Democrats are doing it. But I know right. that the Green Party, I read the entire, so in the town hall, the Green Party was there and I, I talked to them and I read the entire, you know, like their entire plan. And I think the 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 the, the original plan uh, from the Green Party is what needs, you know, to be happening here. It's, 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 is really because this is one thing because I, I you know and as a scientist you know I, I think about this every day I think everyone you know wants to do something I think everyone wants to live in a safer cleaner in terms of water air uh, place they want to live you know like in harmony with their communities but their their lives their lifestyle right now they're forced you know to work for these corporations who act like dictatorships who take over 40 50 hours of our of our week then we're too tired then we only have you know very little time and we usually spend that time with family or you know just having to having some time to recover and go back to work so i think people are just so busy trying to survive yeah. so busy trying to and every area has different issues like the uh, uh, in New York City, housing is the main issue in New York City. Uh, and anyone that knows me knows that I'm fairly involved in that. But we have to begin changing that focus and realize without correcting the climate change issue or working towards it, we won't need to worry about housing. Oh, so, yeah. No, I think I think housing, housing should be a uh, human right. You know, I, I don't right. think housing should be a for-profit venture you know I, I don't think and this is that uh, some people call me radical uh, I, I don't i don't really care you know if if if, 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 ra if being radical is, is telling everyone deserves you know a place that they can protect themselves from you know from nature and from other uh things and then you know and, and the same thing with healthcare, and the same thing with education you know the, mm -hmm. same, the same thing with food right those are the essential things of life the same thing with water right um, we we can't really put a price tag on those things, and and by putting a price tag on those things is how we got to this issue in the first place. Right. Everything because revolves it, around the dollar. Yeah, and and that's the thing. That's we need to uh, move away from that. I think you know um, the Green Party has been saying this, like you mentioned before, the indigenous um, communities all over the planet have been. Giving us born like here, and when the wildfires happen here, uh, the indigenous uh, communities from Sonoma County uh, told us. I remember going to this uh, event. They we they told the city, the developers, not to develop this uh, mountain here, which is called Fountain Grove, which was the area that suffered most of the losses. And they said, you know, that mountain burns every forty years. It burns, and you know, like. And they didn't listen because they just wanted, you know, this right. big, you know. Well, it's like, like here on the East Coast, everyone wants to live on the beach. Yeah. yeah. So they want so. the business, they want the beach, they want. But you know, sometimes you know, like we are limited to you know the the options because you know of just the way nature is or the way nature is acting because of us. Right now in Puerto Rico, and again, this is just another example on how. You know the people who are ruling the ruling class in in the majority of countries in in the world, uh, they're really not taking this as serious, serious, or they just don't care. Yeah. Because Puerto Rico right now they're still giving permits, you know, to uh, developers to just develop right there in front of areas that are going to be submerged in the next, you know, decades. Mm -hmm. And, as, you know, just from one year to the next, one year to the next, you can see the changes in how, you know, sea level rise has, has been impacting many communities uh, in the island. One of my professors back in Puerto Rico, uh, Dr. Maritza Barreto, she's a geomorphologist, geologist, specialist on coastal processes. She's been monitoring, you know, like erosion and, and, and sea level rise um, for you know like uh, decades now. And what she's saying is that you know a lot of you know 
uh, coastal developments are at risk. They're going to disappear. They're going to they're going to be losing. You know, not only their their homes, their businesses. They're going to be losing uh, a lot more uh, than that. And they still don't uh, listen. That's why I think you know we have to uh, really think about who are we. You know, like electing you know as our representatives in in our governments but that that's one thing though that i that i my personal thoughts on that we really have to be careful in how we use the political system because we don't want to be pushed into a corner where the republicans come out and say those leftists are at it again but at the same time just talk about the facts and kind yeah. of pull back from the political part of it yeah, no, I, and I think I think you know the facts are, you know, key and important. But at the same time, is like there are people who just don't care about facts, you know. Like, and and fortunately, and, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I deal with that every day in in, in my in, in the university. With you know, when I get students in my classes and I present them with facts about you know climate change, the facts about global capitalism. And they have so many myths, and so many wrong uh, ideas in their mind because of you know like the the power of the media, the power of 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 corporations today, and on how they you know like uh, Noam Chomsky says how they manufacture consent. You know they they you know if if you get bombarded every day with you know these ideas and these ideas, you will be you know. It will be okay just to find terrible things just because you, you see them as normal, right? And I think that's why we need to move. Uh, and I think, you know, something big needs, needs to happen. I think here is not only about capturing government because even if Bernie or Elizabeth or more progressive, you know, like um, candidate is elected president, right? If they don't attack the root problem, which is, you know, the economic interests that are behind the government. Right now, you know, since the 1980s until today, you know, the, the neoliberal era that began with Thatcher and Reagan, you know, they see government as a frontier uh, for them as resources to exploit and, and, and to minimize the role of government as, you know, like the welfare state and, you know, use government as an enforcer of, of capitalism, uh, you know, in their countries and abroad. and. I, I, I think that it's not enough just to capture government. We need to reform and we need to, you know, like, you know, develop some new uh, institutions. And, you know, we even need to, uh, you know, like have a constitution, constitutional, like, um, how's he, how's he going in, uh, an assemblea constitucional in uh, a constitutional assembly. assembly right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in order for us to, we're, we're still... Well, that, that that frightens me because we don't have the same level of intelligence in government that we did when the founders came along. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that frightens me. But, you know, we're, there are half a million people, and I don't, I don't think if anyone watches this from outside the country, there are half a million homeless people in the, in the United States. And you're living in California can see that because there's over oh, yeah. well over 120,000 people on yeah. the street. Uh, yeah. We need to change the way government works. Yeah. Uh, those tax credits that uh, uh, were given to the rich should be put back into government. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another thing, another thing that you know, I, 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 this is not a very popular opinion, but it's something that is is a fact too. You know, the U.S. military is, uh, is kind of a, one of the most is, is the is the most um, polluting um, like government organization in the planet. Yeah. Is yeah. it, it, it produces more greenhouse gases than 140 countries, yeah. right? And no one wants to talk about it because, you know, here the argument is, oh, we don't have money for the Green New Deal. Oh, we don't have money. Uh, That's for because we spent seven hundred million dollars on the budget. Yeah, and the, the last and, budget. And the last budget deal between the Democrats, and I'm very sad to say that some Democrats, some progressives voted yes for this, uh, even increases the military budget by even more, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it was like, you know, like almost eight hundred billion dollars or something, uh, close to seven hundred, eight hundred billion dollars this year and next year. And when you look at 
you look at that vast amount of money and the waste, right? Because right now there's also this audit. The Department of Defense has never passed uh, an audit, right? Uh, right? And, and then they don't know what happened with, you know, like, I don't know how many trillion dollars. Uh, I think there was this article in, 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 um, in the nation uh, by a research, uh, researcher that did kind of analysis and audits and found that since the 1990s, the uh, Pentagon doesn't know about 20 something trillion dollars where they have gone. Right? So, you know, we, we have the resources, we have the people, we just need to allocate those resources. Imagine if we reduce our military budget, you know, by, you know, like, 70 percent it's still going to be the highest in the planet mm -hmm. right? even if we reduce it by 70 percent and we use those we bring all of those um people here to the u.s we give them high paying jobs you know to restore our ecosystems to rebuild our infrastructure we employ our all of our people here we guarantee everyone you know a job everyone that wants to to work you know everyone wants to you know contribute to something they want to be part of something right they're just you know not they're just forced to get you know the first job that uh, shows up and the first job that appears because they're in debt right now we have a, a student debt crisis too mm -hmm. right and uh, imagine if we were able to use all of and this is not a popular opinion because this goes against you know like the uh, dominant narrative uh, in the US in which you know military funding is sacred and you can't touch it. For other things, but we 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 can use it, you know, and 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 you know the the next top five, you know, military powers in the planet uh, are not because one of the concerns that I hear is, oh no, if we drop you know that number down, then we're going to be you know exposed, and some countries are going to take advantage of us, and they're going to. Uh, uh, if you look at the next top five uh, countries, I don't think anyone wants to mm -hmm. you know invade China or Russia. Or you know, like France, Germany, the UK, Japan. You know, I don't think I don't think those countries have been you know suffering from lack of investment. In but if you if you look at the the military industry, mm -hmm. the whole thing is basically there to protect the uh, American economy. We're we're in the Middle East because of the oil there. We don't yeah. give a damn about what's going on with the Palestinians or oh, the, the petrodollar. Yeah, yeah, the petrodollar. So yeah. we and need to change our yeah. yeah. And, and and when you mentioned the American economy is 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 really you know the oil industry and the military industrial complex you know that benefit mm -hmm. uh, the most uh, uh, from that because you know like normal people you know don't really um, I don't I don't see the benefit of us being you know of my tax money being spent on regime change wars all over the planet and toppling governments uh, in many cases that were elected by their people just to put you know someone that is more us friendly in order for us mm -hmm. to maintain our hegemony um I, I just don't see it and it, that goes uh, as you know as a scientist um as someone who who thinks a lot about things that we need to do uh that is on the top of my list, you know, we want to, you know, reduce um, emissions drastically, and at the same time, you know, free up some resources to fund uh, a very ambitious, aggressive Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the the one that closer to the one that the, that the Green Party um, uh, promotes and develop. Um, I think I think that's where the money is. You know, and people, the same thing, you know, the same thing, oh, there's no money for healthcare, there's no money. Oh, wait a second, but there's money for subsidies to oil. There's money for the military industrial complex. Um, there's money for a new space force, right? right. So uh, it's just, for me, it's, it's just, you know, it's just hypocrisy, you know? It really, it really is, yeah. yeah. But but to, to move us along, uh, can you speak a little bit more on the adaptation of where should we focus first in preparing ourselves for the climate change? So I think in, in adaptation in terms of, you know, like 
you know, following this idea that we, even if we stop all emissions, um, we're still going to be dealing with uh, some uh, extreme uh, events associated with climate change. I think adaptation should be addressed at the local regional level mm -hmm. for, you know, each location, because each location is going to have their own unique right. set of, 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 so for example, here in California, um, our big issues are wildfires, extreme uh, heat, uh, floods and mudslides, right? We can rank them from one to four, right? But again, in the state of California, some areas are more prone to wildfire, some areas are more prone to extreme heat, some areas are more prone to mudslides, right? So based, we can do kind of a, uh, our adaptation strategy be driven by, you know, like our scientific understanding of the processes that dominate in each area and build you know, all of our knowledge on those processes and from that start, you know, implementing some best management uh, practices, right? In the case of, of wildfires, you know, like buffer areas or try to avoid areas entirely uh, to develop because we know that they are prone uh, to wildfires, right? Uh, have more resources in place to combat, right? Those uh, wildfires, you know, have, you know, like, just either, you know, areas that are right now developed already, but that are in areas that are very, very, very prone to wildfires should be just, you know, like not allowed to develop anymore and just relocate those people out, you know, and, and there's a lot, like right now, you know, I like to talk about the example of Cuba, for example, I have a, a lot of colleagues uh, and, and, and friends uh, in, in Cuba who, are right now leading on a big relocation effort uh, because of sea level rise, because of storm surge. Because right now it's not only that the sea level rise is increasing, every time there's a hurricane, the storm surge is also going farther inland, right? And there was this article in, I think in Science Magazine and this, this, this other article in Scientific American talking about how uh, the Cuban government and civil society are working together on this massive plan uh, to relocate thousands and thousands of families out of the coast because their main um, issues in Cuba when it comes to climate change is uh, sea level rise, uh, storm surge, uh, and hurricanes, right? And I think we can learn a lot from what, uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, what they're doing in Cuba, you know, because we're actually doing the opposite. You know, we're, we're opening up our, uh, precious coastal areas to more and more development, right? While other places in the case of Cuba are actually moving people away uh, from those places, right? So I think uh, adaptation strategies uh, should be uh, managed, you know, uh, uh, and with a combination of, of kind of a local level understanding, regional level understanding, right? And supported by you know, state, federal uh, authorities, right? Um, one of the things that I like to emphasize on this is that, you know, just on the adaptation effort, we can, you know, like employ a lot of members of those communities to lead on this efforts, right? In, in the case of, you know, places like uh, Florida or the Southeast where we need a lot of like mangrove wetland restoration, right? Uh, where, you know, we need to uh, transition, decarbonize and transition completely from fossil fuels. We need people to, you know, develop the new uh, infrastructure, right, or update the existing infrastructure in order to. Uh, so I think that a lot of those adaptation strategies are going to be um, kind of unique to each location, uh, with some locations sharing a lot of things in common, of course. And a lot of those uh, best practices are going to involve, you know, like uh, members or need to involve members of those communities. And not only because what happened in Puerto Rico is that after, you know, like Hurricane Lake Maria, instead of, you know, using those funds to employ uh, Puerto Ricans on the rebuilding effort, right, mm -hmm. and, and, and giving that money to the community so that the, the, the small businesses can thrive again and so that, you know, you can kind of reactivate the economy. What they did is they gave those, you know, I think $4 billion to major corporations like Cobra, right? Like, you know, the same corporations that have made billions out of the destruction of Iraq 
are the ones who are making billions in Puerto Rico. So this is what Naomi Klein calls like disaster capitalism, right? How, you know, instead of, of those resources that are now available because in Puerto Rico, even though we're a uh, territory, we're a colony of the US, we still pay $5 billion, close to $5 billion in taxes. And we haven't even gotten that back, you know, to uh, from the federal government, even though, you know, like, uh, U.S. corporations extract close to forty billion dollars a year in profit from Puerto Rico, right? So, and that's the thing. I think if we want to really, you know, like uh, have some like ambitious adaptation, deep adaptation strategies, like we talk about, and like I talk about in uh, my open letter, uh, when it comes to uh, restoring sensitive ecosystems, you know, mangroves. Uh, wetlands, um, you know, rainforests, you know, like river systems, uh, when it comes to rebuilding our infrastructure, when it comes to guaranteeing healthcare, when it comes to, you know, like updating our buildings, right, so that they're um, able to, you know, survive and, and provide, you know, shelter during this more, this more extreme period that we're going to be uh, living we need to be able to involve our communities as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We can't just hire, you know, some, you know, multinational corporations that are going to then subcontract and then bring people that are going to be doing the job for less money and all of that. And, and this creates, you know, just, just reinforces the problem that we have. Right. And, and that, that's for me is, 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 is the, the, one of the ways to do it. What are your feelings on, um, for quite some time, I've thought that we should be building more sea farms within the uh, landmass. Uh, you know, we have urban farmers using hydroponics to grow mm -hmm. food, uh, and we should have farmers farming uh, fish for those communities. Uh, because the oceans are going to be impacted. There are going to be losses of different fish throughout the world. Should we be investing in, in businesses like that, do you think? I think so, because, you know, like, um, one of the issues that we're having and that we're going to continue to have is that, you know, a lot, and especially in the Southwest, you know, we're going to have a lot of stress on our water resources. Right now here in California, though I live in wine country, you know, a lot of this is maintained by a combination of the fog that we naturally get from the Pacific Ocean and the mountains, you know, because of the mountains and the Pacific Ocean, um, but also from the aquifers, right? And, and what's happening here, happening in Mexico, is happening in China, is happening in many places in the world is that, you know, since climate change is also altering the water cycle, right? we're seeing that the places that are usually wet are getting wetter and the places that are usually drier are getting drier. Right? So those places that are getting drier, they're uh, relying a lot on, you know, like uh, underground resources on aquifers uh, for their use. And, you know, the thing is that aquifers do not, you know, like, you know, replenish themselves at the same rate as, you know, normal river systems or, you know, it takes a while for them to get to, you know, like their previous levels. Right? And, and if we are extracting more than what we're allowing it to go in, we need to think about what other ways can we, you know, be creative when it comes to, you know, like um, using the water that we need to grow our food and to, you know, like uh, also grow and maintain our, you know, like um, fisheries or like, um, like um, and I think hydroponics and uh, other kinds of technology might help, um, uh, with that, but I think is again, it's going to be uh, unique to uh, the locations and the regions overall uh, stress. Right? Because if, if it's difficult to get water, uh, just because it's, it's just getting drier, it's going to be difficult to to put up any kind of a uh, effort to combat that. So, so there are some places that are going to be, I think, relatively relatively okay, uh, but there are some other places that are going to be experiencing, you know, like very very. Um, you know, like um, scary lack of resources. And what we're seeing is, again, is that, you know, those who pollute the less, those who, you know, like, um, let's say, 
have the 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 lowest carbon footprint in the planet are the ones that are going to be dealing with um you know the worst um of this you know people uh in africa and south asia right in 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 south america those are the ones in 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 all small many small islands in the pacific those are the ones that uh, are going to be dealing with you know like uh the biggest um let's say issues associated with climate change so we have to think about how do we balance all of this out because we're here in the west yeah that, that that was one thing that uh, uh, I was surprised that in the report that came uh, last week, dealing with the equity and helping mm-hmm. to improve the poverty, yeah. uh, I found it a little strange because on one end we're talking about reducing parts of the economy in one area, but we're bu- trying to build in another area. I'm mm-hmm. not sure that the scale will necessarily. Uh, work in that way because, as you're saying, the poor are going to be the most affected by all of this. There'll be be migration throughout Africa and and parts of Europe, and we've already seen what happened with the Syrian situation with migrations. So that's another thing that the governments are going to have to deal with. Yeah, I think, think, again, it goes back to, you know, like, we have to rethink you know, the whole way that we, you know, live in this planet, you know, and, and going back to, it's not like we have to surrender, you know, all of our technology, all of our, but we do have to relinquish some old practices that uh, have been, you know, like uh, really disastrous uh, for uh, our environment, for the well being of all of us. Right. And I think, you know, like, you know, in terms of industrial agriculture, you know, and, and the way of, of, you know, like ample uh, land use transformation for you know for cattle ranching or for you know those are things that we really need to question. I remember reading this um, paper with my students a couple of years ago on researchers that were saying that if we just you know stop eating beef, just beef, you can still eat chicken, pork. You know we can in the U.S. we can reduce uh, our emissions to pre-1990 levels just by this is not only you know like the emissions that the cows themselves produce when they chew their food right when they process their food is the entire industry is how much land is, oh. is occupied in the u.s and in other countries like brazil argentina where you know like cattle ranching is a big industry how much land is, is utilized how much water this how much food how much soybeans are we growing just to feed these cows right and how much you know, uh, greenhouse gases are being burned to transport this all over the, the planet, right? So just by just one, you know, one decision, you can still, you know, eat your meat, you know, you can, st- you, and you don't even have to, you know, like leave it completely. You can reduce drastically your, you know, the amount of it. You can, instead of eating it once or twice a week, once or twice a month, right, that, that's still going to have an impact, right? Some people don't like it. Right, because that goes against, you know, their way of life and everything. But that does, you know, play a big role because this is an industry that, you know, is 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 really, you know, is a great example on how all of this is connected. It's not only about, you know, like uh, carbon, you know, the the methane that they uh, emit at the source, but also the the entire carbon footprint of the entire industry. Right, and I think that that, that is something that you know, brings the water issue, the food issue. So this, there's this water food energy nexus, you know, and, and, and geography and many other like engineering, environmental sciences that we're trying to address all of these problems from kind of a nexus where everything is interconnected and related to each other, not isolate those things, right? So food security, you know, land degradation, climate change, you know, um, health issues, they're all connected, right? We can't really, you know, that's, I think this is why geography is so important uh, today. You know, I'm a geographer, uh, climatologist, and, you know, I think the, the, uh, the best tool that we have as geographers is our um, kind of a way of, of looking at the world as a web of interconnected systems that are connected to each other 
and that if one uh, is altered, the other ones are also going to react, right? Instead of, you know, seeing the world as, you know, like individual, you know, actors or processes acting in isolation to each other. And I think that's that's how, you know, economists want us to see the world because they they don't even, you know, they when they talk about, you know, like water, air, you know, soil, they talk about as externalities in their models. Like, oh yeah, those things are just, you know. but you know, their wealth comes from the, the food and the things that grow out of the soil, right? The, their industrial processes are, are happening because of, of the water, right? And, and you know, they're, they're using the atmosphere as their, you know, um, um, you know, like the, the place where they threw, out, they threw out all of their trash, their pollutants, right? So um, we have to really, you know, for me, is a, a total transformation what needs to happen like psychologically, but also physically, right? Because I think the first thing that we need to do, and for me it was hard, you know, it was brought up, you know, in kind of a, a semi-conservative family growing in Puerto Rico and, you know, never really allowed to question anything related to, you know, like uh, politics or, you know, the political parties who were in Puerto Rico, like in power, and you know their economic views like you were not allowed to question those things it's not until you know i, I start getting very curious you know towards the end of my you know high school and then you know my university years that i get to really understand you know how this you know whole system operates you know the and and i think you know i don't blame people for not necessarily you know understanding and 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 uh, and kind of a having this sense of urgency that I do have. I just think that they're just dealing with other, they, I don't think that there's, there's, it's not like they are not intelligent enough or uh, capable of understanding the, the issues that we're trying to uh, solve. It's just that they are dealing with just surviving. And I think, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm, this might be kind of a, you know, on the ending, part of, of our discussion here, in order for all of this to happen, for adaptation to happen, for mitigation, for, you know, transforming our societies, first we need to guarantee that people are going to be able to live a life of dignity, right? At least are going to be able to put a roof over their head, put food on their tables, you know, get care if they are sick, get an education right we need to guarantee that people because if if we are you know inequality keeps increasing and increasing and increasing people are just gonna they're gonna throw climate change to the back because their main problem today is you're surviving and this is what i think a lot of activists uh, in the us and europe and other countries don't understand when it comes to latin america africa you know south asia so, oh, they they just don't care. No, it's not that they don't care. They just have one priority, which is you know surviving, you know, so that I can live the next day. But if you take that, I solve that problem. If you tell them, you know, like now you're gonna have, you know, you know, because of your work, you're gonna be able to, you know, live a life of dignity. Let's work together to solve this problem. Then that that creates the situation on which we can get everyone. Uh, on board, but if we keep, you know, like dividing and we keep giving more and more, you know, like um, power and wealth and privilege to small group of people, this is going to get worse. Yeah, and as you can see in Puerto Rico, where the people have finally gotten, oh yeah, had it. It's, yeah, it's governors in the, in one week. I mean, that's yeah, it was it was it was amazing. That for me, it was beautiful. You know, like. Uh, I was watching it from over here from California with tears because I wanted to be there. You know, my friends were sending me pictures and, you know, and, and that, that just shows how, you know, when people are united on an issue, because this was, this was universal, like Puerto Rico, the pro statehood, pro independence, pro colony people, all of them were now we want this guy out. Mm -hmm. right? That's what we need to do. We need to find, you know, we need to create 
these circumstances where people are not just, you know, competing against each other to survive uh, in order to bring them together and, you know, like fight for climate change the same way that they're fighting to get rid of their corrupt government officials. Yeah. And we have to get government to listen to us. And that's, oh, yeah. that's at the point, you know, as I said here in, in New York City, it's housing and every day there's another event where uh, the government refuses to listen to the people and we need to change that. So, uh, so on that, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, and joining us. I, if you don't mind, I'll put uh, uh, your open letter uh, at the bottom yeah, of uh, our yes. page. So Please do. Can, yes. And uh, um, again, thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mike. And I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. And hopefully we can, you know, see each other in the future uh, when things get better. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Okay. All right. All right. Have a good day. All right. You too. Thank you very much.